Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our snap. Tonight we're very lucky to have uh, Tom Lawson from Madison presenting. Uh, but before I turn the mic over to Emily from Object, who will introduce Tom, I want to hype up next week's lecture series. Uh, we're lucky this, this semester where we essentially have an artist now talk almost every Wednesday. Next week, we have Sean uh, Sleeman presenting. Let me tell you about it. Sleeman examines land use and nature and how they are co-opted to create advantage or discriminate. His work explores the politics of access to natural resources and how such assets are acquired and employed. That is next week. Sounds fascinating. Sounds like a very interesting lecture, um, as every week is. Um, so at any rate, let us um, continue what we do best here, where we listen, honor, respect artists of all, all sorts and stripes, art as an intellectual pursuit, multidisciplinary, uh, art as craft, art as art, art everything. And let's, let's continue asking really fascinating questions and have a dialogue. To me, one of the best parts of artists now lecture series is the dialogue that we have with the artists. So let us keep asking challenging, thought-provoking questions that shift the conversation. And I assume this posse right here is object and medals. Are you going to be here next week? Yeah. Better be. I'll be counting and looking, right? Yeah. We have numbers. We have power in numbers. I mean, this is impressive. Is this required? <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, great thing about medals is the object. <laughs> Any great thing about medals is the object group and the energy that comes out of that group and the enthusiasm. So Emily from Object is going to introduce tonight's guest. So Object endeavors to um, augment the student experience with practical insight from professional artists. Um, therefore, we've brought in Tom, and um, as was said, we're bringing in Sean Slemon next week, and also be on the lookout for Iris Eichenberg. Um, we're also sponsoring her visit, so look out for that. Um, also, we'd like to announce our annual jewelry sale. Um, that's going to take place in the Union Concourse on November 21st. So stop by, check out some sweet, sustainable jewelry. Um, okay, so on to Tom. Tom is currently chair of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Department of Art. Um, Lozier has been head of the wood and furniture area at UW-Madison since 1991. He holds a BA from Haverford College a BFA from Boston University's program in artisanry, and an MFA from the University of Massachusetts, North Dartmouth. Tom designs and builds one-of-kind functional and dysfunctional objects that are often carved, painted, and always based on the history of design and object making as a starting point, <laughs> as a starting point for developing new form and need. Um, he received four visual art fellowship grants from the National Endowment for the Arts. In 1993, he spent six months in Japan on an NEA Creative Artist Exchange Fellowship. In 2003, Tom spent six months teaching and researching in London. In 2010, he collaborated with his wife, Bird Ross, on the design and fabrication of the highly kid-friendly very interactive and not at all traditional reception desk for the new Madison Children's Museum. Uh, much more information on his work is available at www.tomluder.com. And uh, without further ado, here is Tom. We'll see how that is. Can you, how's that for? Voice. Is there anybody in the back that can't hear me? <laughs> you can hear me. Okay. Um, 
So th these are from the um, Wood Type Museum in, uh, is it two, two rooms? Is that, yes. is that what it is? Yeah, so I think those are super cool. <coughs> um, so uh, thank you for having me. I've been getting to spend a lot of time in, in Milwaukee lately, and I'm really enjoying it. It's really wonderful. And it's nice to get to know the, the art department a little bit too. So I'm really glad to be here. I'm going to go through a lot of pictures and I have the PowerPoint split in two because it was starting to get too big for one PowerPoint presentation, so it'll be a little transition in the middle. But I wanted, I wanted to start by honoring my, my sort of touchstone guy and, and to sort of make a nod to the tradition and the history of furniture making. I am primarily a furniture maker. That was my training and my background. This piece is from 1917. And uh, the thing I was sort of saying today in the class meetings that I attended is I really believe that if uh, this piece had never been built, none of us had ever seen it before. And if somebody managed to generate it today as a, as a new object, it would still look fresh and radical. And it would be in all the design magazines and published on all the design blogs. And I think that's quite an achievement. And what, I, what I'd like to talk about this piece is one thing about the maker here at Rita is that he was the son of a furniture maker brought, um, trained in the family business. And um, I think it was pretty traditional work that they did. And I just think it's remarkable at those moments that someone is able to so totally make a transformational object. And um, I think that what he was doing here with this object was really trying to get somehow at the essence of what a chair is and break it down to its most basic components of two planes which support a body in space. So there's the red back and the blue seat. And you sit on those. And the rest of that black stick structure looks a little bit complicated, but if you really do a good visual analysis of it, there's nothing there that doesn't need to be there to make that object work in space. So it's actually an extremely rational, sort of relentlessly rational <coughs> distillation of what it takes to support a body in space. And it's kind of a touchstone object for me. There he is down in the lower left. That's him sitting outside the shop with the shop assistants. They're all smoking, even the kids that look like they're 12 years old. And, uh, and then some of his other designs that you may or may not know. May or may not know. He made quite a bit of um, kids, kids uh, objects like this toy wheelbarrow. So anyways, on, on to my own work. I am primarily a furniture maker, and pretty much all of the objects that I make uh, have some sort of relationship to function. Either they function as actual furniture objects like this does, but I'm very interested in kind of pulling and twerking and morphing uh, functionality in ways that make the objects um, sometimes more challenging to use. And, and uh, you'll sort of see that as I go through. So this is a, a very early piece from the 1980s. And um, it's a love scene for two people that become progressively more loving as they move backwards in the chair. <coughs> and um, this is probably, in terms of the spectrum of where my work sits, this is uh, pretty much a, much more at the straightforward functional end. This is a very large uh, king-size bed. But it shows some of the things that I'm interested in. I work a lot with color, um, although everything underneath the color is wood, it's carved wood. I work a lot with color and patterning and using that color as a compositional element to move your eye around the piece. And you'll see I'm mildly obsessed or maybe very obsessed with stripes. And I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, this, is, this is one of the better images I have that show some kind of tip, sort of a typical surface, what the surfaces look like that I work with. So um, let me see if this pointer comes up. So what you're seeing here is you're actually seeing the wood showing back through the painted surface. So I, on a lot of my pieces, I work with carving techniques to generate texture. And then I come in with um, painting to lay colors in. But I very often work back through the paint to expose the wood underneath and so that you get a sort of a layered surface. And, and in essence, I get sort of a free color by bringing the wood back through the, um, the painted surfaces. You can see this piece's direct connections to here at Rebelt. This would have been a piece from the 1980s. And um, I think, you know, this piece actually, there's another ver different version of it. It wouldn't have met his sort of rigorous um, analysis and his sort of demand for paring down to essentials and using verticals and horizontals. But I was very interested in this as a way of building using these black stick structures, which are, they're kind of flexible. And you can uh, build in a way where you use them almost like line drawings. And so I could add, I could add pieces in and kind of compose as I was building. 
And that's one thing that I like to try and do in furniture building. There, um, one of the challenges with furniture building is it requires a fair amount of um, pre-planning and construction, and um, in some cases, detailed technical drawings. And so I tend to gravitate towards building systems that allow me to be more flexible and, and a little bit spontaneous as I'm building. This is a piece of, it's actually quite tall, it's about, um, it's about six and a half, seven feet tall. And I made it just really as a, as a composition, as a composition of shelves. Um, and it was purchased by a woman that had a collection of cups and saucers and she wanted to display them. It's a 360 degree piece, so you can put pieces all the way around it. Um, I, I don't like to do commissions. I find them, I find them, I'm, I find I don't have the right temperament and the right personality to do commissions. So most of the, pretty much everything I'm going to show you is work that I make and I put out there in the world and, and see if it, it finds a home or see if it resonates with somebody. Um, this is a, a piece that I first made when I was getting out of my initial woodworking training. The, the charge was to make a production piece. Um, with the idea, I think, being that that might be something that would help you sort of get going in your artistic practice. And so I, I worked with the challenge of generating a chair which folds out of a flat sheet of plywood. It's, um, you know, I think since, I think quite a few people have addressed that, that question. But I made, I made this piece so that when it folds flat, it hangs on the wall. And it's a, borrowing from that sort of shaker concept of when you don't sit in it, when you're not sitting in a chair, you get it out of the way, you put it up on the wall. And so it has sort of two existences. It has its um, three-dimensional form as a, as a chair, and it has its flat form where it hangs on the wall. And this ended up being a really important piece for me. Um, it, it was picked up um, in quite a bit in, in design magazines and got quite a bit of publicity. And in the 19, early 1980s, there was no internet. <coughs> that was kind of how you got your work out there. And, um, and, it, and so I continued to work on it and try and develop it as a production piece. And it was a semi-success, semi-failure. It was very successful. I made um, 48 of them over about a six-year period. And I, um, I was able to subcontract some of the parts construction, and then I would get the kit of parts back, and I would put it together. I always painted them differently, but this, although the structure stayed relatively the same. Um, and so in that way, it was really, really important to my career in getting my name out there and, and so forth. Uh, it ends up not being a particularly good uh, production piece because it's fairly fussy and, and detailed. And if you actually look critically at, at production furniture, it's usually incredibly simple and worked out for production systems. So there was, this was actually looked at by a manufacturing company in Italy and they we negotiated an initial contract. They took the stuff over to their factory in Italy and the guys on the factory floor were smart and they said, this isn't a good production chair. So they were, you know, very ethical. They didn't rip me off or anything, but they said, well, wait a minute, we don't think we're going to go with it now. But I learned so much from this whole project in terms of the options of making a one-of-a-kind item, thinking of sort of a limited-scale production item, or looking at how you interface with the actual um, production furniture industry. And so the, this picture with the five, those were the last five chairs that I made. And so I made them from 1990, 1982 to 1988. And in 1988, I, I just decided to stop making them because I was kind of known as the folding chair guy. And I didn't want it to just be the folding chair guy, so I stopped making them. Those were the last ones, and I moved on. And so now if you follow, you get a little more information about how this works. If you follow in the upper left, that's what two of them look like when they're there. Um, it works with, stain, with a stainless steel pin which slides inside of a bush hole. And so if you take, uh, if you take this pin out, and then you can see over here it's been sort of relocated to a different location. That allows you to swing this leg up under the seat, it's held by a magnet, and then the whole seat drops off of a little, um, a little shaped um, platform right there. And then the seat drops down, and then this whole unit swings flat, and then they hang on the wall like that. So I'm very, very interested in that transformation from two dimensions to three dimensions and how the, the planes move in space and, that, and all of that. This would be an example of a piece that was thoroughly drafted out, but then at a certain point I was so confused looking at the drawing 
and where the different parts were going to go that I just um, I had to start putting it together and working it out in actual full-size three-dimensional models. <clears throat> so one of the things that I've found that's happened over the years is certain kind of themes come up but fairly far apart and sometimes I don't even see the connections actually giving artist talks is a really good way to start to see the connections because you put all your images up there and you start organizing them. And so this is a project I did much later. This would be, I think, like uh, mid or late 90s. I did this in Madison at Tandem Press. So Tandem Press is a fine arts printing facility that's part of the art department. And occasionally they'll invite a lowly faculty member to come in and do a print. Usually they're bringing in outside artists with, you know, who are experienced printmakers. But I got to do a project there, and so I came to them and, and asked them about the possibility of making a three-dimensional print. Or a print, a constructible print, really. And um, there, there's, a, there's some precedent for, for doing that. But anyways, I thought they, they were really liked the idea. And so I worked with two master printers there who knew all the techniques and sort of you know, gave me suggestions and I made a lot of paper models. And then what we ended up with is this um, set of um, wood, these are, these prints are woodblock and silkscreen prints. And a set of prints, if you follow the instructions that are incorporated into the print, they're sort of like cut lines and fold lines and peak lines and valley lines and blue areas. If you take this print and you cut it up and you follow the instructions, you can um, put together this relatively useless <laughs> paper chest of drawers, which has an actual working paper drawer which can hold styrofoam peanuts or something, <laughs> something like that. And so obviously I don't really, I'm not that interested in that concern about resulting in a functional object, but I think that, you know, again, I'm really interested in how something moves from flat to three-dimensional form. And, um, um, yeah. We, so the idea, with, the idea here, of course, would be that you would um, buy the set of prints and, or maybe you buy two sets of prints, you take one and keep it framed on the wall, and the other you would do the actual model, you'd, you'd actually build the paper chest of drawers. And um, in, in practice, again, it's, I think, you know, in, in practice what happens is a relatively complex construction system. You have to be a good model builder to put it together, but anyways. <clears throat> uh, one thing I, I really liked was the way that the master printers and, the way we figured out the wood grain onto the actual pieces is just um, we actually for we wood block printed with low quality plywood like a cheap fur construction plywood that has that hard soft hard soft thing we wire brushed it a little bit and then printed directly off the plywood and it gave it that nice um, gave it this nice texture right there so I was really happy with that so I I, um, I primarily do work with wood and my my base my highest skills are in getting manipulating wood, but um, I like to work with a lot of other materials, and at one point I did a series of work that was just using corrugated paper, and it was, um, I'm not, you know, it's, it's hard to remember exactly how I got started on, on things, but I think it was partly a reaction against the preciousness of wood, and in the field of um, furniture making and woodworking, there's a real sort of reverence for the beauty of the material, and boy, it is beautiful stuff, but I think sometimes that can be a problem, and and so the thing that was nice about working with the corrugated paper is basically zero to no value. I just got this at a box, um, box, plate, the box production place, and they made a bunch of boxes that were the wrong size. They, I filled up a whole pickup truck for free with this stuff. And um, what's interesting in this particular one is this, this set of cardboard boxes was white on the outside. And so to make it white, it just has this really thin, straight line white stuff. And what I did is I, I glued it up in big blocks. So I took the cardboard boxes and I, I, I realized in retrospect that what I was doing is I was sort of reconstructing lumber. I made these big, huge chunks of cardboard. And then I used the bandsaw, sort of like a lumber mill. And I milled the cardboard like it was lumber. And I sort of explored all the different ways that you could cut through the cardboard and the different kinds of surfaces you could generate um, by the angles that you cut. And so in this piece, I glued just colored artist paper in between the layers of cardboard. And then when you cut it at an acute angle, you get these nice sort of wavy lines. And um, just sort of the dovetail joints in the corner are sort of like a woodworker's inside joke, because dovetail joints are sort of the symbolic of permanence. 
and dovetail joints are sort of ridiculous in a cardboard box, right? <laughs> and you know, most people would look at this, and most people with any sort of sense of the archive bodies of materials told me these were going to self-destruct you know, relatively quickly because of the acidity of the paper. But I'm actually surprised that the cardboard pieces that I can still see, um, more than 20 years later, they're still in amazingly good condition, although I assume at some point the acid will take over. Acid will eat the paper, but the dovetail joints will still be there. <laughs> and I incorporated some, uh, I incorporated wood in some places, but now that I, when I look back at these pieces, I actually like the ones that are more dealing with the paper as a structural material. And there you can sort of see a little bit of the different kinds of surfaces that I was able to generate by cutting through in different sorts of ways. I tried and experimented with uh, corrugated paper drawers, which is a really terrible idea. So they don't work particularly well. But I was interested in that. So this is the one piece that has the sort of large volume of cardboard, which has a really nice quality. It's not cardboard, it's correctly called corrugated paper. Um, so the, the other thing I like to do is experiment with non-traditional ways of putting things together, always in the hope of trying to figure out ways to work faster and make it work more quickly. And most of the time, if it doesn't work very well, I find out that the, 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 the traditional techniques were the smart ways to build things with wood. But this is a set of work that I did where there is um, just threaded rod running through these legs. It's a threaded rod that's buried in a nut inside the top. And then the threaded rod runs through these things, and there's a bolt in the bottom. And this is a case where the actual table does go together pretty quickly. You know, you get it together in a day. And um, what happens with me is I'm really, really interested in the surface treatments, the colors, the patterning, and how I can use uh, surface treatment to bring out certain sort of characteristics. And so what would happen is I would put these together pretty much in a day, and then I would spend weeks painting them, which is really what I enjoy. I mean, I, I really like that aspect. So I'm not suffering while I'm painting. But um, this is sort of a series where I tried lots of different um, surface treatments. This is just a texture paint with oil pastels and clear lacquer over the top. It's, it's probably an archival nightmare. But um, I just in the interest of trying lots of different techniques and lots of different materials. And I did some, some of these where I incorporated um, really, really beautiful sections of wood. Um, in this case, it's actually veneer in this case. So um, some people get mad at me, especially when I started painting um, furniture in the 1980s. People would get mad that you were painting over this beautiful material. It seems to be much less of an issue now. But I don't paint over it out of disrespect for the material. I love wood. But I think it's more, you know, for me, it, it's more to do with getting more, more tools in your toolkit and more colors in the color spectrum that you, that you can work with. So I don't think that paint and color is an insult to the material. I think it's a compliment. Also, we're still in the avenue of how you can build things more quickly in a woodworking shop. This is a different technique that's usually described as um, bandsaw boxes. And it's a, it's a pretty cool technique, but you start with a large chunk of wood, and you initially work subtractively with a bandsaw with a couple of cuts that cut away different sections. And then you can create negative spaces, and you end up with a pile of parts on your bench pretty quickly. And as long as you remember how to fit together, you can take out certain elements and glue it back together and actually construct things relatively quickly. And it's a technique I really, really like. I've spent a lot of time exploring it. These are, these are relatively large. This is probably 40 inches top to bottom. And I've done a lot of experiment, a lot of experimenting with bands on box. So these would be relatively early ones. I'll go through these quickly. <clears throat> so you can see, I spend a lot of time playing with colors, just um, color relationships, and um, I'm pretty much, I mix all my own colors. And so those, what you saw so far, those were bandsaw boxes that are wall-mounted cabinets. I've also done a lot of experimenting with um, boxes. These are you've done it the same way, starting with chunk subtractively and then turning around and working additively. So this is a stacked box with um, three pieces on two boxes with a lid on top. And then this is a set of boxes. This is three boxes with a lid on top. 
So in the lower picture, you can see the lid, the lid taken off, and then more and more just kind of taken it apart. And this next piece, this is actually the same structure, but taking a, a totally different approach to how um, the carving works and how the painting works. So just kind of experimenting with um, a, exactly the same structural form, and how differently can you make the piece look um, in terms of how you work with surface treatment? So it's that one at the top, and that one, or the same box. There's that one taken apart. Um, we, we talked a lot about tradition in the two, two classes that I met with this afternoon. And I, I work very much within the context of historical furniture. And the more, the longer that I've worked with wood as material and built furniture, the more I respect the historical methods, and I think I've come to understand some of the ways they do things. So I, what you're seeing here are different versions of blanket chests that I made that are basically sort of celebrations of the frame and panel system of construction. So here's a, here's a frame, it's a white oak frame, and then the panel in the middle. The reason this exists is because of the basic fact that wood expands and contracts with moisture. And so if you take the same front panel here, and you make it just out of one board of wood that covers the whole way, with all the grain running one way, it likes to warp and crack and check and do all kinds of things. So some smart person in the history of furniture making figured out this frame and panel system. And if you sort of apply it, if you look critically at furniture, you're going to find it everywhere. And it's this is something that I, I sort of appreciate and admire, and, and I've tried to work with a lot in the, the series of blanket chests that I did. Um, this one has copper panels. This one actually has glass panels, so whatever you put inside the cabinet, you would actually see it stacked up, which I should have done with the picture. Um, and so these are loosely inspired by um, pieces that I saw in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, um, historical blanket chests. Um, they're not at the higher end of the furniture spectrum. It's not the, it's not the fancy Boston and um, Philadelphia stuff. It's the more rural, um, more rural stuff that actually appeals to me. So that's what I was looking at and working with. And I started doing this, um, I think there's a detail. So I started doing this um, chip carving technique on, on the edges which is um, something that I do by hand with a chisel. And it looks in these images like it's quite precise and measured out. But I do very rudimentary measuring, and I give myself some freehand pencil lines, and then I do it with a saw and a chisel working freehand. And it's work that I really, really like. It's sort of repetitious, and I, I just enjoy doing it. And um, if you look close, if you saw it in person and look closely at it, you'd see it has this sort of irregularity of working with the hand. But uh, the repetition, your eye blurs it out and makes it look like it's got some precision to it. And I, I like that sort of play back and forth. So this is still this kind of series of blanket chests. And you've seen a lot of stripes now. I don't completely know how to explain what it is that I like about stripes. But the two things I've been able to sort of figure out is I like the directness of the color relationships that it sets up. And I'm just I'm really interested in that, how colors affect each other. And uh, I can spend a lot of time playing with that. But the other thing is just compositionally, I think maybe this, this lower one, um, the thing I like about stripes is the way they lead your eye around the piece and they sort of explain the piece to the viewer. And it's very, very hard for your eye to land on the middle of a stripe and not move along it. And so they're, they're visually dynamic and I like that about them. Could also be some strange thing from my childhood. Uh, so these are more and more in the same series and give you know, a fairly good picture in terms of giving you a sense of what the surfaces and the textures look like. And um, <clears throat> again, revisiting that idea of a frame and panel, but this time taking the frame and panel and actually making it structural so that the frame itself, the sort of purple and turquoise thing, becomes a door that opens in one direction and the panel in the middle becomes a door that opens in the other direction. So they sort of open across each other. And I'm also interested in this idea that um, what happened, what you see on the outside of the piece might not tell you everything you need to know in order to understand what's on the inside of the piece. This was an initial exploration of that. You'll see some more of that coming up. And these are actually very recent um, 
blanket chest where I, I change things up a little bit. And um, I was thinking about the thing that happens with blanket chests is that you pile stuff up on top of it so you can't open it anyways to get things that are inside. And so I played around with this idea of what if the lid stays stationary and you sort of acknowledge that it's a bench and so these shapes are meant to be sort of referencing tractor seats. And then what if you actually access the storage space underneath by pulling it out. And so these, you know, these have stainless steel wheels on them that it can actually, it could actually roll completely around like a giant compass um, if you had enough room to roll it all the way around. There you can see a little bit in motion. So it has a pivot point on the back side. And um, those wheels, I had, I had those wheels subcontracted out by a machine shop and they thought those wheels cost more than the wheels in your car. <laughs> but they're probably good for millions of miles because they're solid stainless steel. Um, this is a, a, a different sort of think, thinking about storage a little bit differently. I made mean, these after I moved to Wisconsin in 1991 and just looking at the silos and, and um, what these are really is laundry basket silos. And so these are, these are quite tall. They're, I think they're a little over six feet. And these are conceived as month-long laundry baskets. They can hold as many clothes as you want, so you don't have to do your laundry until you're really ready. <laughs> you just keep throwing things in over the top as on the left. And then when you're ready to do your laundry, you open up the bottom here and um, take your laundry out. But there's a couple of mid-month um, retrieval hatches if you need your favorite shirt. <laughs> so it was, you know, I was just I was sort of playing around and having fun with that idea of fermentation and that idea that a laundry basket can be that sort of place. And so it's fully ventilated with all these holes and so forth. It's my, my only truly Midwestern piece. Um, these, are, these are wall cabinets. They're a little confusing to explain in um, a little confusing to explain in two-dimensional format. They're about six feet, this one is about six feet long. What you're looking at is a cabinet that's attached to the wall. And it has drawers that move in two different dimensions. So if you were to grab the black knob and the pen, you can see that you, you can slide the main drawer unit left or right. So the top picture it slid to the right, and the bottom picture it slid to the left. But there are also 10 smaller drawers that come out in the opposite direction across the grain. So in the top picture, you see five of those drawers coming out. And there are five more drawers which are hidden. You can't access them. So the lower picture is not a natural state for this piece. It's just an illustrational picture that I took. So I pulled out all 10 boxes. And the boxes, the drawers themselves, are actually miniature bandsaw boxes that um, are sort of architectural explorations. And so the idea here is that it becomes a somewhat um, a challenging piece to understand. You're probably not going to get it at first take. And it's that idea of the inside is more complicated than the outside. And how do you figure out what's going on inside this box? So then the next step, or a different version of that, a different interpretation of that. Um, this, this piece, um, again, it's a wall cabinet. These pieces that are sticking down, that look a little bit like legs, those are just braces that hold it solidly on the wall. What's going on is you've got an outer case with openings, and then you have an inner case with five drawers in it, but there's a lack of synchronicity between the inside and the outside, so that uh, in the top, picture you can access the mustard colored drawer on the right. But you can't access any of the other ones. You can reach in and you can sort of rattle them around, but they won't come out. And so you as the user have to find have, you have to tune this device to access each individual drawer. It's based on you'll like this Frankie. It's based on the concept of a vernier caliper, which I, when I was explained to me how a vernier caliper works is an incredibly clever device that lets you see a thousandth of an inch. And the way it lets you see a thousandth of an inch is it has two scales which don't line up. And you can see which of the you can see which lines do line up and which ones don't. But you could never adjust the calipers a thousandth of an inch, it just wouldn't work. So I thought that was a really I love that model. And then I'm, I'm interested in what happens inside the inside each window as the picture sort of changes inside each window. And then, Third, the third iteration of this was to try and make it more, a little bit more ambiguous. 
And in this case, I, I reversed it so that when you come up to this piece and you want to move the main drawer, you grab those two big uh, handles, the one that looks like a pickle, and you grab those handles and you slide, the whole cabinet moves to the left and right. So the interior of the cabinet stays in one place and the outside slides over it. <clears throat> and the, out, the external carcass is completely encases the inside. And so you can see here, if you look at, there's much more overhang on the left than there is on the right. So at the moment it slid to the left, but if you slide it to the right, the upper picture is the transitional moment where you see the different things that are going on inside. And when you slide it to the right, the ones that you were originally seeing disappear. And this is the same structural format, just a different, different visual, uh, just a different way of painting and treating the surface. This was definitely the most confusing. Like when I was making this piece, there was more than one time where I put a screwdriver inside the drawer while I was making adjustments. And then I went to open the drawer and the screwdriver was gone. But of course the screwdriver wasn't gone. I, at some point I just shifted the thing and so the drawer I wanted was hidden inside the cabinet. <laughs> and so, um, I'm, so I'm kind of talking about a um, sequence of thinking about cabinets and storage and boxes. And so what the, you know, the basic, um, in the furniture making, the basic uh, chest of drawers involves a carcass or a framing device. And so this was uh, just an, an attempt to sort of blow away the carcass, use architecture as the device that locates the drawers in space. So it's nine separate drawers that could be placed anywhere on a wall. And it doesn't have a definite size or shape. It's um, user configurable. And this was a, some, in some ways similar, but I was doing a different thing here. This is a, a set of two, a, a pair of a progression of drawers. And there was kind of about this conversation between um, functionality and visuals, or um, what happens with this piece as you go from, here on the left you've got a, a full-blown drawer with a nice little knob that you would grab. And then what happens as these um, knobs grow is they suck the actual physical space out of the drawers into these giant knobs. So what you end up with in the end is this kind of two-handed, squished grapefruit-sized knob with nothing very useful behind it.
just a fairly straightforward um, chest of drawers where I did a series where I played with a standard drawer size. It's just a 7x7 seven seven drawer module, and I played with patterning across the drawer panels. So this one was uh, just a 5x3, then I did one that's 4x4, four four, then I did a tall skinny one. I'm spending a lot of time working with the color and the, and the color relationships and so forth. Um, and then I went back to this idea of the, this is, so here, here on the left you have a very traditional uh, chest of drawers carcass, pretty much as straightforward as it can be, four basic drawers. But what if you leave the carcass there, but again you start to uh, play with and complicate the interior spaces. So it's, this idea is, you know, obviously it's just drawers within drawers. And what happens to that interior space? What does it make it like to use this piece as an owner, user, viewer, whatever? So in some cases there's a drawer that comes out the side and then there's another one. That comes out the side. But it's that idea of exploring the piece to fully, fully understand what's going on. And so I've done a couple of these and um, sometimes, in, the, in, this, in this case I was painting it um, to leave the drawers a little more interior drawers a little more hidden, just flipping the strap over. And then this later one, I made them really stand out. And in, in this lower right picture, you can kind of see what happens in the interior space. It gets to be fairly complicated, and the box that protects the little drawer is visible inside the big drawer. Um, I showed you a shaker image before when I was talking about the folding chairs. And so shaker's work is another um, uh, aesthetic that's had, had a big impact on me. And for me, it's the, um, it's the attention to proportion and size and massing and scale and, uh, and repetition. That's what I really, really admire. And so this was a piece where I did 18 drawers, and I tried to do um, a range from the smallest possible drawer you can make in the upper left to kind of a dumpster sized drawer in the lower right that uh, is about as big as you can make using traditional woodworking techniques and then have every size drawer in between and then the challenge becomes um, what's the right way to interact with this piece what goes in each drawer and this little tiny one in the top is a set of chopsticks or a pencil or something but um, the, the other part of this then so this would have been a piece that I drew out completely in the drafting form and I, I would spend a lot of time like worrying about, you know, does this one right here, does it need to be another quarter inch to the right or a quarter inch to the left? And, and also things like the spacing size of the stripes. And um, you know, there was probably a better mathematician than I that could have worked out a lot of this stuff mathematically. But I did it on the drawing board sort of by trial and error, looking for these sort of lineups to happen and um, looking for ways to allow the eye to move through the piece in a lot of different directions. That's what I admire. That's a place where they would store their clothing that was not being used in that particular season, like the winter clothes or the summer clothes. This is in uh, Kentucky. I'm playing a little bit with um, the idea of um, turning things upside down. It is a fairly strong visual convention that smaller drawers go on the top, bigger drawers go on the bottom. So in the right, over here, I just split that over and put the small ones on the bottom. What is that, what is that like? <coughs> the little tiny stuff on the bottom. And the two pieces are um, palindromes of each other. They're opposites. One reads one reads one. They read the same. Sorry, I'm not explaining a palindrome. It's the same forwards and backwards. Okay, I'm going to move, moving on from cabinets, that was sort of an intensive dose of pieces with internal volumes. I'm going to talk a little bit about seating, which is another territory I spent quite a bit of time. This is a, this is a very recent piece. Um, this is a set of chairs intended for a group of people to use that uh, it's essentially a visual graph of proportion. So if you think of this as a graph, the variable from left to right is um, skinny to fat. So the three left chairs have very skinny proportions. Three on the right are very, very fat. And the variable from the front here, and the variable on this axis, is short to tall. So in the middle, 
but there they are just from another view. In the middle you have, this is the chair that sits in the middle that's sort of like, every, you know, normal chair, sort of regular proportions. And then as you move out in any direction, you get taller, shorter, skinnier, fatter, and diagonals change two variables. So the challenge here, the only thing that stays constant is the seat height. Seat heights are pretty prescribed, or they can't vary too much in order to work with dining chairs. And so other than that, I was looking to work with nine different sets of um, skinny to fat and height to generate nine chairs that were, had decent, uh, likable, workable, aesthetic proportions, but were incredibly different. And so it, uh, it was, again, sort of pushing and pulling things together to work right. And so those would be the three big, uh, three tall ones, the three middle ones, and the three front ones. And so the idea here is that sort of Goldilocks thing of which chair is, which chair is just right. So I, have, I haven't made the table for this set yet, but I envision it's something like this, where a group approaches the chair and what's that social negotiation of who sits in what chair, what chair is just right, what chair is too big, what's the authority chair, and maybe the same person would pick different chairs on different days. And this, um, well, you can see what it is. So, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, these are both sides, so it's a reversible chair that gives you the option of a rocking chair or a conventional chair. So the left one's in rocking mode, the right one is in its standard all feet on the floor mode. But whichever mode you pick, you've got the other one over your head. Um, sort of, if you're, it's especially effective if you're rocking, you're sort of rocking, but there's this thing up over your head. And so, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I really admire that sort of ladder back chair structure, and I was interested in sort of grappling the two chairs together and see, seeing what would happen. So this is the same chair uh, in its two modes. So in its rocking mode, it's black and gray coloration. And you flip it the other way, its coloration is white and gray. <clears throat> and again, thinking more about rocking chairs, but, but thinking about rocking structures that function as a, as a uh, social event, there's a social dynamic about. So these are collaborative rockers. I did a series of these. So um, these are my kids back when they were cute. <laughs> <laughs> That's Cecil on the left and Delia on the right. Delia's a high school senior now. And um, they were generous enough to model for me in the photographer's studio. And what you can see is um, that in this particular configuration, this two chairs straight up and down, um, it works very well as a collaborative event. They, were, they had a blast. When Cecil gets up and walks away, uh, Delia goes out of balance. It doesn't really work by itself. It's a team, team effort to make it, make it work. And then if you do a slight change and you tilt the two chairs in towards each other, it's a little bit more intimate when they're both there. But if Delia gets up and walks away, Cecil, it actually works fairly well. Cecil's pretty much vertical. And this is um, the, it's a fairly traditional American. You see a lot of outdoor furniture. It's usually called like a tent, tent chair. And so this one um, has a, sets you up in a nice sort of relationship with the other person. But still, the rocking action really requires two people to make it work. And then about the last one, uh, that's Delia on the left, that's my wife on the right. Delia a little bit later, but just a back to back where um, there's this thing where you, you're moving together, but you're actually not facing each other, you're facing away from each other. But you have this way that your bodies are communicating. Um, I've done some um, outdoor um, public art projects. This one was in Darmstadt, Germany. And um, this was in the town forest in Darmstadt. And um, these, I made chairs using rustic uh, chair technology. And I gathered the wood in the forest, and then I attached it to existing trees in the forest. They really managed their forest, so they wouldn't let me drill holes in healthy trees. So I got the ones that had been hit by lightning. And, uh, <laughs> you'll see this. There's actually, I mean, this tree was totally gorgeous. Um, but so I made three installations along this walkway, and there was probably work by about 25 artists. And um, the families in Germany, they go to the forest and they go for walks as a family, and so they would walk around and see all the art projects. And so there were some of the German kids 
Um, the second one was attached to a tree that uh, was dead but had these amazing funguses growing on it. So it was pretty neat too. The last one I attached seats just to a huge fallen stump. It, had, it also, another artist was working on the ends and had put um, poems by Rilke on the ends with um, paper pulp. So it was really beautiful. And then uh, we had a chance to repeat. The curator from Germany was invited to come over to Wisconsin. In northern Wisconsin, in the state forest, we, um, we, did, we repeated the event. She brought a lot of her international artists, uh, really from all over the world, and a bunch of Wisconsin artists. And we, um, we did another installation. And this time I worked with my wife, Bird Ross. And we, um, we got chairs from uh, UW Swap Surplus, the Surplus Shop. And we um, collected chairs and we did some different configurations for seating in the forest. So in one case we just worked with wooden chairs and made this kind of row of seats. We tried to get people off the path into the, a little bit more into the forest where the ticks are. And then we did another set that were these sort of conversation seats um, that were scattered in the forest and these were um, two um, aluminum and vinyl chairs which were zip tied together in this kind of little bit intimate way where you would sit in these chairs and, and hopefully have a conversation. Or you could sit in them by yourself. This is a forester for northern Wisconsin and he was great you know, that he was willing to let this project be done in this forest. In our last installation we made a kind of a um, berry ring of chairs around a tree. Ah, uh, okay, so now I gotta change. Uh, I gotta change over. If anybody has a question, you can ask me now. Most of what I've shown you, most of the, the question was what the paint is. Most of the paint that is on there is a, a modern version of a traditional milk paint. It uses milk protein and lime, um, and so it's sort of like a casein paint. But um, you know, these are recipes that people would often put together at home on their own, so it always came out, came out different. But there's a company called the Old Fashioned Milk Paint Company that, that sells it by mail order, and it's a really incredible product. And um, it's very quick drying. It's very very tough. It doesn't. Um, and the, generally, the way you put it on is you apply it, and then I steal wool it. it it dries very, very matte, and then I still wool it, and that's what brings it back through the paint, which I really, I really like. I sort of do that intentionally. So it's a cool material. Um, still in the seating realm, this was public seating that I did for a, um, a museum show at the um, what's now called the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. So for the Wisconsin Triennial, I, I made a proposal to them that I would do public seating. So I made these uh, benches that um, you could sit down on at the exhibition and look at the art, and they have um, different ways that they move. So this one has three backs that are sort of like Adirondack backs, but the whole back has spins, and so you could rotate the um, piece and look all the way around. This one turns it inside out, and so the backrest stays in place, and the bottom the seat itself is like a giant lazy Susan, so you sit on it and you can spin around. And so it's, it's all well and good if you go in and you sit on it by yourself. You can use it exactly the way you want. But if two people sit on it, then there's this sort of forced social negotiation. And, um, and you know, I think ideally I like the idea of two people that um, didn't come to the exhibition together would sit down on this and realize, hey, that guy wants to look at that painting, but I want to look at that painting. And we have this sort of social interaction based on the seating configuration. So these are a couple of my graduate students just demonstrating how they work. And then I did another proposal for a most recent <coughs> triennial when the now the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art had moved into their new spiffy home on State Street and it has these giant glass windows and that seemed to me like the premier place to put some public seating. They usually have this amazing Deborah Butterfield cast horse in there. I think every time they take the cast horse out of the window their clientele complains, where's the cat, of course? But they took it out of the window for a, a summer, and I put these benches in. They're made out of industrial felt, 
and they're held on by steel strapping. And the one that's the furthest away is a freestanding one, but the other two are actually attached to the structural columns of the building, so they're wrapped around the columns. <clears throat> so in the lower right, you can sort of see that's the, that's the prow of the building and how it relates to the state capitol. And so um, this is a few shots in my uh, workshop. And so it's a, wood, it's a woodworking shop, it's not a fabric shop. And so we set up these big tables, and this is Jeremy Cox, who was working with me at the time. And I bought um, three minivan loads of industrial felt from Delaney's Surplus, north of Madison. And then I bought this outrageous, archaic, this is still what you buy in the fabric catalogs to cut industrial felt. And it's like a handheld meat cutter. And OSHA has not been anywhere near this machine. It has no safety devices. And so I get such a kick out of this picture of Jeremy as he's staring at me while he's pushing this thing through the felt. And it cuts the felt. It's got a wheel that spins and it cuts the felt as though there's nothing even in front of it. So um, we had, you know, but anyways, we cut miles of felt. And we, made, we assembled these pieces uh, in my shop. They're actually constructed over uh, plywood armatures. And, um, and we built them in my shop originally around um, concrete, casting, or concrete casting tubes that were the same size as the structural columns. And then we rolled, you know, we took, put them completely together in my shop, took them apart, numbered them, made them into rolls, took them down to the, um, to the museum and wrapped them around the columns and installed them. And uh, you know that was an example actually of inventing a structure system. I was very nervous about it. it actually worked quite well. So that what's holding it all together is steel strapping um, that was used like for packing stuff for shipping on trucks. Uh, but the, when you can tighten those things down with a giant lever, you can put huge amounts of torque on it. So this belt is extremely hard, um, rigid stuff. So you can see in that profile on the right how much uh, pressure those straps are putting on. And I was interested, I had lots of different kinds of belt. Again, there you can see the stripes, I couldn't help it. Even though I didn't get to paint them, I still had stripes. So that's at the opening. And it, it functioned, it would not have held up well over multiple years because of the felt sort of, because of the felt belts, right? <clears throat> <laughs> Um, so now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and, and show you a, a project. Um, one of the things that I like to do in the woodworking program at UW is I like to bring in other kinds of woodworking systems and, and expose students and myself to other ways of, of building and working with the material. So that's my wife rowing a 12-foot rowing skip that, that uh, I built as part of a summer project where I work with two graduate students. And this is a 12-foot rowing skip that weighs, I, I think, about 40 pounds. And it's built, it's a funny combination of high-tech modern materials and traditional materials. It's built using aircraft Dacron, so it's sort of like vintage airplanes. Um, and then it also uses Kevlar, a very modern material, as a stiffening device. And you'll see a little bit how that works. But this whole system, this is the gentleman in the upper left, uh, Platt Montfort, who unfortunately is no longer alive. He's a New Yorker that moved to Maine, who has one of the world's most interesting accents, New York merged with Maine. And um, this is, uh, his, he has all these different designs for boats. This is his smallest boat. This is called the Sweet Pea, and it weighs 80 pounds. As you can tell by the fact that he's holding it in one hand like that. And it's, uh, that's actually not intended to hold a fully grown adult. It's a child's boat. And um, so we, we work from using his technology. He likes to make them sort of fast and crude. And he sort of says that all the time in his instructional material. But being woodworkers, we couldn't help it. We sort of overbuilt these probably a lot. And um, we built them over the course of a couple months. And then the big revelation, which we hadn't quite figured out, is when you put the boat in the water, you see the water through the bottom of the boat. So that was the first boat that we put in. It was like, hey, wow, look at that. And then you get in it, and you start rowing it, and you actually watch the water move under the boat. It's quite magical. And there's nothing between you and the water. It's just um, aircraft background. And so we did three boats, and so there was one with the red seats, that was Ben Wooten's row, and he wanted to be able to take his fiance rowing, so it has the two seats. And the one on the left is mine, I did it ultra, I tried to make it as lightweight as possible. 
And then Matthias Pleisnik made his into a sailing rig, which adds considerable weight. So a, a little bit about the process and why this was an interesting thing to bring into the shop. Um, it, the, the system for these boats, although they're sort of high tech, the system is very traditional. You um, build the boat over um, disposable stations. And these st the stations are uh, like these. These are the stations right here. So they're just disposable, cheap plywood. But that plywood is identified in the drawing of the boat. This is what that form looks like at that particular point in space. And uh, so we're going to identify what it looks like here at the bow. And another 24 inches down, we're going to identify it again. In between, you're just going to blend it together. And so you, you run the lengthwise pieces called stringers, and they essentially draw the form for you. And then um, in this next sequence, you'll see Matthias taking a piece out that's been steamed, bending it into a rib fit shape, putting it inside the boat. And so now you've got the ribs which go across the form. So you, now what you're seeing in the right is a boat shape that is extremely underbuilt. The dimensions are tiny. So I could stand at the front of this boat, somebody else could stand at the back, and we could torque it in opposite directions, and the whole frame would go you know, like that. And um, this is a, a boat that we built later in Maine at the Haystack School. This time we did it, it's kind of a hybrid canoe kayak. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about the system. We did this as a, as a, as a group project in a workshop. And um, we had the boat in the water, I think, on the eighth day. So we had a lot of work reads, you can see. And so there's the hull. And then the hull gets turned upside down. And one of the key moments is when you take this Kevlar, one of the characteristics of Kevlar, if you're holding it, is uh, you know it's loose, floppy thread. If you pull it tight, when it snaps tight, it won't go any further. It has like zero stretch. And so you attach it to the gunnels, the top edges of the boat, and you create, you triangulate, you run it diagonally across the form, and you weave it all over the hull. And then when you when you attach it with um, a hot melt adhesive at the gunnels. At that point, you could stand at the front and back of the boat and try and twist it, completely gone, no more twists. It disappears completely thanks to the Kevlar. And then this lower picture is showing the Dacron draped over the hull. And then the Dacron is also attached to the gunnels, the top railing of the boat, with a hot melt adhesive. And uh, because of the compound nature of the forms, there's no way to attach the fabric over that shape so you don't end up with wrinkles. So in the upper picture, I think you can see that it's quite sort of wrinkly. And then it sounds weird, but you iron your boat. And, uh, and it tightens up, and uh, all of the wrinkles go away, and you get a, you get a skin that's sort of like a, like a drum, drum skin. It's very thin and somewhat fragile. But this one probably weighed in the 20s. So anyways, um, I have, do you have a question? Yes. the skin yeah. to make it tougher. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a good idea. And then you could like use different dyes that you do with uh, polyester uh, resins, <laughs> like the resistors. Uh, I think that would be pretty awesome. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So this, the, skin, the skin is actually, it's the aircraft Dacron coated with uh, marine varnish. And the marine varnish penetrates it. Um, it is not, it, it's quite good for impact. Like, you wouldn't have an easy time punching your hand through it, but if you hit it with an exacto knife, it would go right through it. So, yeah, I don't know what the answer is. My boat's about five years old and it only has one hole so far. But I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, when the skin is gone. But you know, it, I mean, I don't want to get too far off track. But the concept comes from the, um, the um, um, Eskimo um, canoe, uh, Eskimo kayaks, are skin on wood frame. So that the wood frame, there's a wood frame in the um, coffee shop in Bay here. What's the name of the coffee shop? The, with the cool name. Spence? What is it? Anna and I Coffee Shop has a, has a wood frame uh, that is the exact wood frame that would be used to stretch the skin over. But so the concept there is that you stretch the skin over and at the end of the fishing season, you take the skin off and you put a different skin on every year. So that's, it's a really interesting 
uh, scan on frame votes are a whole thing you can look into. I better keep going. So, so I, I have a, so one of the grad students I've worked with took, took this boat building technology in a particular direction, and I showed those pictures earlier today. But what I did is I, I continued to think about the boat form in terms of um, function and dysfunction and movement through the water, and the idea of what if a boat was not symmetrical? Um, what if a boat this boat just goes in a circle all the time? So this is done as a, it's approximately a one-third size model. So it's about, these are about three to four feet long. They're non-functional. I never skinned them or anything. Um, I felt that what I was trying to do was really sort of illustrate an idea. And once I got it to the point where it was getting an idea across, I didn't need to do more. Um, so that's the, that turning around. And then what if a boat uh, had the form of locomotion of a fish? And what if it wiggled its it wiggled its way through the water. This is just a sharp left turn. <laughs> and it's funny because with some of these it was almost like, it actually is almost like an illustration of the way stuff moves in um, cartoons. You know, the guy runs off the cliff and he hangs there for a minute, and then he goes down. So it was sort of that thing of taking a, a 90 degree left turn. <clears throat> this one's called Over. This one's called Drop. More like, this is probably the one I should show when I talk about the cartoon. And this one was, uh, this one is called Eddy. So thinking about that circular thing that happens as in water movement. And this one is called Screw. So again, maybe implying another way that something might move the water. There's a, a couple more studio shots. So these are, you can get a little bit of a sense of the scale, but these were built as sort of like large scale models, and they were built using the traditional, uh, exactly what I, I want to show these to you, because it's exactly that same thing of, uh, here's the stations. So in this case, you've still got the same stations that define the form, I've located the stations along a curved piece of wood, and so that one ended up being over. And here's the sharp left turn. Here's the stations just taking that sharp corner, and then taking the stringers and just running them over that stations. Still that boat building technique for building form. There's the round one, and there's the screw one. So in the screw one, the stations are located spiraling around a central axis. Kind of makes sense? Um, I'm going to just quickly show you a couple of things I'm working on more recently. Um, I talked a little bit about the bandsaw boxes. Um, these are pieces where I start with a chunk of wood and I work subtractively, uh, trying to find something that I have sort of sketched on that I know exists inside, and trying to um, and rotating the piece on the bandsaw and putting pieces back together and trying to keep track of where things are, and generating these um, kind of little chair conglomerations, which are all cut out of a single piece of wood. I have no idea where this is going to go. I don't really know what it is. I haven't figured out a way to make these. I'd really love to make these at a bigger scale. These are models like this. Um, but I've been having a lot of fun with them. And I've been playing with these sort of chairs that coexist at different scales at the same time. <clears throat> so kind of, um, I don't know what they are. So this is an example of something that I'm working on that I'm having fun with. I don't know exactly where it's going to go, but I'm still thinking about it. And um, other things I've experimented with is um, um, pushing wood past its limits and seeing what happens. So this is a, uh, something where I work with the Forest Products Laboratory, which is on the Madison campus. It's the Federal Wood Laboratory. And one of the things they do is they break wood for a living. And they're the ones that, when you buy wood at any lumber yard, it has a stamp on it that sort of rates its engineering properties. They help generate those engineering properties. So they know how to break wood. They can break anything. And um, they, they can break a telephone pole. And um, so I took them some oak. And um, I had them crush it inside a giant hydraulic press. And so the piece on the right is oak. Now, the piece of oak was inside of a steel tube, sticking up above a steel tube, 
And so here's the top of the steel tube, and the piece of wood is a little bit above it. And they use the hydraulic press to push it down. And this is how it, this is the wood in failure. And so I, uh, we broke a lot of pieces. Some of them were really beautiful, and some of them were less beautiful. But this detail on the right was one that I thought was really, really beautiful. In terms of, it says something about the material um, that I, I really liked. Um, so another thing that I'm still sort of thinking about, I don't know exactly where that's going to go. Um, I've, I've made a few clocks where, um, I'll just explain quickly, it's, uh, I think other people have, have also done this, where the, uh, I, there's three clock mechanisms in there, so I've broken the clock down into hours, minutes, and seconds, and so each one is recording a different thing, and then you mentally have to reconstruct time to get it right. So, um, like the one in the lower right is, 10 to, 10 to 10, right? You can read that. Anyways. Um, and I wanted to close with uh, the project that I mentioned. Um, at the, it was mentioned in the introduction. I worked, the main thing that I did last year, I worked with my wife on the, this reception desk for the new Madison Children's Museum, which is an absolute showcase museum. Um, the director of exhibitions, Brenda Baker, uh, used work by 130 Wisconsin artists who the museum. There's work by one non-Wisconsin artist who makes big water features, but the rest, she, she commissioned work by 130 Wisconsin artists. It's everywhere in the museum. And uh, you gotta go, they have, um, they have no kids nights, so they don't let kids in. It's just, it's just adults and beer, and you go and have a fun time. And so anyways, we, uh, we asked to do the reception desk, and. This is a sort of an overview in the lower right. And um, we, we worked with the idea of it being interactive so that there's, um, there's stations where the parent or whoever goes to actually buy the ticket and has the interaction with the museum person. But the rest of the place is really a place for the kids to play while their parents are doing what they need to do and figuring out the museum. So um, we work a lot with drawer mechanisms and drawer systems. Um, and I'll show, you'll see how some of these different things work. Um, and this is just the gate that allows the employees to go behind. Um, this is a bench that we did with book covers. These are golden books, which are printed in the golden books are from Wisconsin. Can I, can I show? Where are they from? Racine? Um, this is the, actually the disability end, so we have to learn sort of what those sizes and proportions, how that works. Um, and so these are some of the interactive things. So here there's a, this drawer, this big thing, you pull it out and it's sort of a telescoping drawer that comes out of the parts. This is a, um, you look into this and it's a totally mirrored space, so the mirrors multiply. And it's really interesting. I would say that this mirrored box is one of the more popular things when I watch kids playing. This is the thing where you reach your hand in here and it goes back by back, back and you can, another kid can reach their hand in here and your hands meet somewhere so way back in there. <laughs> That's the mirror box. There you can see my hand holding the camera. <laughs> but it's, it's hypnotic, the kids really love that. Um, these are some of the drawer things. Um, when you pull out the ironing board, there's a sort of a geological strata stratification, but the stratification is done by color, sort of junky out, junk objects. One drawer has more, just has this industrial belt. One drawer has a um, sort of a liquid with um, sailboats in it that you can push back and forth and make a storm happen and try not to cover the sailboats. Um, in this one, you push the yellow um, hot cover in and the black one the silver and black one comes out towards you, so it's sort of a surprise on it. And um, this one, you pull it out and these bowls, just have balls that you can sort of rattle and shake. I think that's it. So I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I have one video that um, shows some kids kind of interacting with those. Um, one thing that's really interesting about doing work in, um, in the Children's Museum is just the, <laughs> the rigor. Watch this kid go after these drawers. 
<laughs> no, that's nothing. He really gets going. There. <laughs> she was gentle and carefully investigated everything. <laughs> so it's just it, so what Brenda, Brenda, the director of exhibitions, when she was talking to us about this, she said. Um, the way you have to think about the way kids are going to interact with everything in the museum. She was talking about keeping the kids out and getting behind the um, behind their reception desk. She said, kids move through the museum like water. So if you leave any sort of <laughs> if, if you leave any sort of a way for them to move through something, they love that. Like tight confined spaces are like magnetic. So it's a Holding up pretty well overall. <laughs> so I guess I'm I'm actually done. I'm happy to. <laughs> Now that one has a, a bird on a, on a trapeze and it swings back and forth and there's a worm up here and the bird, trying to get the bird up to get the worm. This one moves like a washing machine and that one seems to be the one that older kids can figure it out. There's a certain age that below, they you don't think to try that rotating motion, whereas older kids get the rotating motion right away. Pieces. I'm wondering if you had an opportunity to share some of that work with members of that community, and if so, what their thoughts were. Well, there aren't really any members of the Shaker community, because Shakers uh, didn't have kids. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so, I don't know, the last remaining Shakers were in Sabbath Day Lake Maine. Okay. And then they had one sort of funny thing where they, had, they for a long time, they weren't letting anybody join the group, and then they let one younger person joined the group. So when I visited Saturday Lake, there were still a couple of, of the older Shakers who were there, but there was also this younger guy that was kind of running around. And I don't know what that means, or I don't know what's going to happen, because the older people were not going to be alive very much longer. So, um, but Sabbath Day has done some really, I don't know how this came about, but um, there was an exhibition cur curated of, of uh, big name contemporary, like New York Gallery artists, did work at, at Sabbath Day, and there were some really, really beautiful pieces. Is there any of that stuff? Uh, anyways, so um, the, there wouldn't really be a way to show your work to the community. But there's places, the places are primarily in um, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, um, and New York, and also, um, there's also in, in Kentucky. And if you ever get a chance to go to any of those places, go. It's really amazing to visit this place. Yeah? All of your furniture, do you sell that to customers? Your furniture is free? Yes, I, I, um, um, I, do, I do, I love to sell my work. Um, I, I basically, because I'm a full-time university teacher, the studio time that I have left, I think, really speculative work. My favorite model is to do um, <coughs> exhibitions every couple of years, to do one-person shows. I like my favorite, I'm participating group shows, but I like to do one-person shows the best. To work on a body of work over a couple of years, because I'm very slow. And then to um, put it in an exhibition, get it out there in the world. I'm much happier when it doesn't come back to me after the exhibition. Um, and I find that sort of, in 
mentally, when I'm done, you know, you pour a lot into the work, but I find that when I'm done with it, when, when I send it out, I'm also done with it. I'm happy, I'm happy to let it go. I don't have any issues with that. I just want to know what part of this I mean. It's where they have the white fences that the horse is behind. <laughs> It, I think it is the way down. And it's, um, I'm just blanking, but I'll, it'll come to me. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you where it is. And that's a really cool place because that's one of the ones where you can stay overnight. Okay? And, um, and, and you can stay in some, in some of the buildings. Okay. Yeah? Um, I am interested in the, the guy who does art for scrap and how it applies to uh, these things that we normally associate with fat. <coughs> You have, to say, you have to say a little bit of that. What makes it art as opposed to craft? Oh. That's the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, personally, I, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, I think it's a perfectly legitimate question, and it's a, it's a really good question, but I actually think the correct answer is that um, work locates itself where it needs to be, and so that I don't really worry about where it's going sort of make it the way I think it needs to be and it sort of locates itself. And I think some, you know, I definitely come from a craft background and a craft training, but um, I don't, I, I don't know, I, I, uh, I it's a, the sort of art versus craft discussion is one that I um, mostly try to not get engaged with because I think it's more about the work and um, what can we do. Making sure that the artist is getting is achieving their intent and sort of getting it where it needs to be, and I and I don't really I don't really care where it falls. I, I see the worlds probably as sort of overlapping circles. Some work you might be able to put in one place, some in another. But um, I don't know. I'm not very good at answering that question. Yeah. It's a perfectly so legitimate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, we're gonna have. Uh, do you guys think we have any, any art showing anywhere now? Yeah. I had a show at the Villa Terrace last year. That, um, so I put a bunch of work up in, just down the street, like you guys can walk there. <laughs> and, um, and then we're going to have a faculty show in Madison in the new um, University Art Museum in February. So I'm working on, I'm working on some new felt pieces that I'm going to put in, in my show. Yeah? Uh, before we started your culture, how did you how did I know what? They could like to stand away of multiple people and say on it. Oh, it's it's um there wouldn't be any question to handle the material. It's like really stiff. Oh. It's industrial felt. A lot of it, some of it was um I had everything from eighth inch up to three quarters of an inch thick. And it's like really heavy, really dense. Different densities. But on the outside wrap, I always put the heaviest density. And um, like it's not soft and squishy when you sit on it. It's solid. But the problem with it is that the edges sort of wear and fray. So there's no question of it collapsing. It's more that how it would wear. Do you have all those kind of chairs in your home? <laughs> <laughs> Which ones? Well, the ones that I still have that I wish I didn't have is that set of nine chairs. I'd like, I'd like somebody to have that instead of having it at my home. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would love to. I think it's a, a really good way to go. Um, I think it's a different sort of mindset to generate design for production. And I think it's a really hard thing to do. Um, I don't think that the production world usually looks to individual makers as a source for designs, which I think they could do more of. Um, and yes, I would very much like to do more. Yeah. So, did you ever find a concept that actually worked faster than any of the traditional ways of woodworking in your pursuit? Yeah, well, occasionally. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, working with the threaded rods is pretty quick. And um, the whole system of the way the bandsaw pieces work, where you're cutting the pieces apart and putting them back together, it is definitely faster. Um, but it still isn't sort of like when you go to a glass blowing studio and you see them sort of 
you know, there's this sort of immediacy and this spontaneity. It's a different way of generating objects, and you just have to sort of deal with it. Yeah? How do you come up with a price for your objects? Uh, here's the, the uh, that's a long discussion, <laughs> but there's one way that you could think about it. It's sort of a test, set, a test sentence, and that is, if you're thinking about price and you're saying, I wonder if this is the right price for a piece, you ask yourself this question, if somebody handed me the money and I have the money in my pocket, but I no longer have the object, but I wish I had the object back, and that means you didn't, that means you didn't charge enough. <laughs> that's the worst, that's the worst thing you can do, you know, to let it, to let it go, or you don't get to get it back and you sort of undervalue what you've done, which is a natural tendency. It's hard for us to value our own stuff as, probably as highly as we should. I don't really think you can do pricing by keeping track of your hours and getting yourself an hourly wage. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work that way in our territory. And so it's, it's a different set of questions. But whatever set of techniques you use to arrive at a final price, before you hand over the thing and accept the money, make sure you're going to be happy with the money and without the thing. <laughs>